Welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are here for the Atto Masterclass today with Jane and we are so excited to get into how to choose the right development agency for your startup. And firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we meet. I am on the land of the Wurundjeri people uh, and uh, Jane today is on the land of the Gadigal people in Sydney and we would like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So I'm just going to do a little bit of intro to Atto uh, to the talk today and then I'm going to hand over to Jane to take the master class to tell us all of the things that she's learned after interviewing and speaking with over 50 development agencies to help her build her startup. So first of all, I'll just talk a bit about Atto and then I'll hand it over to Jane. Uh, so Atto was created in 2019 by Kate Kendall, who's also on the call. If you have any questions about Atto, please definitely let us know. We are very approachable and love talking about startups and how to build a startup on your own terms. And that's what we're all about at Atto. We're all about focus, clarity, and action. And we aim to empower female founders to build startups on their own terms. And we encourage them to use no-code tools first before spending tens of thousands of dollars on development agencies. So that's what today is all about. How can you avoid making the wrong decisions when you're building your startup? Up and how can you get the right partners on board to support you to build uh, something in a way that you want to build it. So we would love to hear from you as well. We've just got a little poll that I'll just launch now. Uh, we want to know how are you building your startup idea? Uh, have you started? Uh, are you doing it all by yourself? Are you using no code tools? Are you hiring a developer? Are you planning on hiring an agency or are you not sure at all? There is no wrong answer here. We just want to get a gauge of who's on the call and what you've got planned. And uh, if you do have a startup that you're already working on, if you have a live website or an MVP or something that you'd like feedback on or just people to check out, please post that in the chat. We would love to know what you're working on and to support you in that journey as well. Uh, if you don't have anything live, but you'd love to connect with us as well, just post your LinkedIn uh, profile and then we can check you out that way as well. So thank you so much for everybody answering the poll. We've got a bit of a mix. Some people not started. Some people are doing it themselves. Some people are using no-code tools. Hooray. That's fantastic. We love that. Some people are hiring a developer. Excellent. And uh, not everybody, no, no one's clicked hiring an agency yet. So maybe you will after this call as well. And you will, uh, you know, get some tips from Jane there too. So I'll just share those results as well. So if you do want to check them out, there's a couple on each. So we will keep going now as well. So as you all know, you signed up today to how to find the right development agency for your startup. And Jane is exceptionally uh, experienced in this area. And we've got a lot of juicy questions that we want to ask Jane as well. Where do you start? How do you brief them? How much does it cost? What are the red flags? What to look out for? Contracts and all of the things. So without further ado, I'll hand over to, uh, hand over to Jane and she'll present for about 30 to 40 minutes. And then we'll go to Q&A uh, in the chat with everybody here as well. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions uh, beforehand as well. And again, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat and then we will get to them at the end of the call as well. Hi, everyone. So welcome to this masterclass of finding the right development agency for your startup. Uh, my name is Jane Coe. I am currently a startup partner lead at Stripe. I predominantly look after accelerators and venture capital um, partnership program across Australia and New Zealand and helping startups grow and scale. Um, now, before we kick off, I wanted to just run through a bit of a, a agenda for today. It's pretty packed because there is actually a lot of information um, and lessons that I've learned along the way that I want to share with you all. Um, so, you know, before we kick off, I'll share a little bit of a background story um, in terms of like how I ended up finding my own agency that I ended up working with for pretty much the whole four years of the lifespan of my previous startup. Um, and then we'll go into talking a bit of uh, some pros and cons and compare, you know, the how do you build in-house versus uh, outsourcing to an agency and some of the considerations you should think about. And then we'll move on to uh, looking at the search process when it comes to finding a development agency of your choice. Um, and, you know, once that's done, we'll move into just conducting a due diligence, like how do you best find out um, which agency you, you can work with and some of the red flags that you can pretty much spot, you know, early on. And then we'll move on to um, negotiating contracts. So talking about contract terms like once you are ready to hire an agency what are some of the things that you need to look for what are some of the clauses you need to put in to protect yourself 
And then we'll pretty much wrap up the session with what's next. So how do you handle any sort of uh, issues that come along the way? And how do you really just maintain that relationship with your agency? And if you do want to end that contract, what should you be considering as well? Now, um, moving on. So as you all know, I work at Stripe now, uh, which is a, a global payments infrastructure company, but actually I'm also working on a side hustle at the moment. So I'm, I'm a director of a property development firm, which uh, not surprisingly, I've also outsourced most of my staff to contractors as well. And I'm currently a Blackbird Giants mentor, so really helping early stage uh, startups that are, you know, at the MVP stage and ready to go to market and just really helping them with the strategy. Um, and previously, I was an ex-founder of Bring Me Home, which is a food tech um, that, you know, allows venues and, and fruit retailers sell discounted surplus food through a mobile app. Um, and I guess that's kind of a, a segue into going uh, deeper into my background story. So, um, you know, back in 2017, which was about five years ago, I had an idea and I I knew that I wanted to, you know, solve a problem in the food waste sector and also working with food developers to, uh, sorry, food retailers and developers to build a product that I can sort of bridge the gap between, you know, food retailers having food waste, um, but not being able to capitalize on it. And so I, I just very quickly knew that I wanted to build an MVP, which is, you know, minimum viable product to take to the market and just test out what's the demand look like? Um, is this going to sell? Uh, will people buy into this? And so, you know, being that non-technical founder, I had very, very limited tech knowledge. Um, I've never really worked with technical people or never really worked with um, developers in my life when I, back in 2017. And so I just very much knew that I need to speak to people that have been working in this sector for, you know, five years plus um, just to learn from them and ask them a whole bunch of questions. Um, it's, it's always better to learn from the experts that are already in the field. So I just knew that I need to speak to developers and understand what do I actually need to build and how do I actually build this uh, product. And so I went through a search process, which I will run through um, in the next couple of slides, um, pretty much just using Google and LinkedIn to find almost 60 plus contacts um, in Australia and also based in overseas and just sp spoke to a lot of people, um, you know, like Lana said, I spoke to over 50 developers to really try and find out all the, just bridge the gaps of all the questions I had about how do I build this thing? Um, and then, you know, uh, and like, I guess going into this as well, this search process, I very quickly learned the, the time that it takes to build something and what the budget should look like. Um, and at the start, I only had maybe 20 grand to begin with, which is nothing. <laughs> um, it's very hard to build a, a digital product with very little money. Um, and what really surprised me was after speaking with like 50 developers, everyone gave me a very, very different budget estimation. And it ranged between $30,000 to over 150 k so that was one thing that I've learned is a lot of developers do their own budget estimation, um, but I just find it very hard to justify the really high end quotes uh, without really understanding what needs to go into it. Um, and the other thing that I've learned throughout the search process is that like developers have their own preferences in terms of how they think is the best way to build something. Um, and I think the reason why is that developers usually when they learn about a certain way of coding or, or when they learn about a certain way of building a product, they end up specializing in that area and they don't really touch, you know, explore other options and learn from it. So um, this is another thing to note is that developers all have different preferences. So it, it is definitely up to the founders that you find as much information and learn from a, as many people as possible to uh, just, you know, really understand what is best for you, uh, you know, given what you're trying to build. So I've definitely learned some hard lessons along the way, even though I ended up, you know, was very lucky to find a developer that I was really happy with, uh, sorry, a development agency that I was really happy with. Um, definitely had some lessons there as well. There's things that I didn't do right or things that I didn't 
I guess, sort out before signing the contracts, which had a bit of implications to complicating the relationship down the track, which I will share with you as well. But that's the sort of background story that I have. Now, moving on to this. Um, so now I just wanted to talk a little bit about the comparison between building in-house versus outsourcing your tech to an agency. Um, the, the first thing, I guess, to con consider are these sort of like factors that is going to make or break your startup at a very start. Um, so the first thing I wanted to sort of cover is the cost. And, um, you know, depending on what the budget that you have, you, you may or may not have raised a little, little bit of funding from family, friends, or maybe some angel investors, but you also do want to be a bit more frugal at the start. If you you don't have a product, for instance, and you just want to have a very basic product version one to take to the market to do some testing, perhaps. Um, these are some of the factors that you should start to consider now. So the first one is around cost. Um, so when it comes to in-house developers, definitely high fixed costs because, you know, you'll be pretty much going through the process of almost like hiring an employee that you will have to put on payroll. Um, but over time, if you have iterations whatsoever, you will incur a bit of a lower variation cost, a variable cost uh, versus when you outsource to an agency that tends to sort of flip. So you can build something very scrappy, very quick um, with a, a bit of a low fixed cost, but it will tend to have a bit of a higher variable cost depending on how complex your uh, product will be. And the second thing is to consider is like time to market. So, um, you know, how much time does it take to build that MVP or the version 1.0 of your product? Um, how much time do you have? That's another thing to sort of consider. And I would say in-house developers um, usually can do it quite moderate too fast, um, but obviously depends on, you know, how complex your product is, how many features you're trying to launch with your MVP stage and the amount of resources that you have in-house. So an example is if you're building an, an incredibly complex product, but you only have one in-house developer, that's going to drag out the time to build for you to take to market. Whereas if you wanted to get something super quick um, and you've got like three developers at the start in-house, you can really just do that, you know, uh, at, at a relatively fast pace. Now, if you outsource that to an agency, um, the time to build will be quite moderate. And, and in my experience, it's been quite fast. Um, so for me, I pretty much build two apps uh, one is for the venues to list, so the suppliers to list their, their listing, and one is for the buyer side for them to look at the listings and pay. And then there's also a dashboard, which is like all the back end um, to manage everything. So all that took about eight to nine months, which um, is for me is relatively fast because the estimated project time was supposed to be 16 months. Um, and so it, it really depends on the agency that you end up working with. Some agencies will have a whole team of developers working on multiple projects and just like moving but in between projects. But some agencies that have like very minimal uh, resources, they might also drag out the time. So this is something that you should probably, you know, look into and, and question the, the agencies to understand the team structure um, a little bit more. The third thing is around um, iteration. So, you know, once you launch a product, you're very likely going to realize that, oh, uh, I need to change this feature. I'm, I'm not happy with this button or, I'm, you know, I need to add new features. And these iterations will take time as well. Um, and I would say in-house developers can definitely do it relatively fast because they would have already gotten all the code or, or all the basics ready and they could just make that switch, um, you know, relatively fast because they're working for you either part time or full time. Um, with an agency, I think it also depends, um, you know, they agencies always prioritize and deprioritize based on how complex a project or an iteration is. So um, this, I pretty much say it's moderate in terms of time. Now, technical skills, um, I'd say this depends on both because it is up to the founder or, or you know, your, yourself uh, to determine how much budget do you have and, you know, really finding the technical skills that either in-house developer or the agency uh, possess when you hire them. So I think this depends. 
if you have the budget to only hire like a junior developer, obviously the technical skills is going to be a little bit more limited. But if you're hiring a senior developer from the start, um, your in-house developer will likely have a very high technical skills and can be quite nimble. Um, and so is the agency. So uh, this is something you can find out just understanding how many projects they've worked on, how many clients that they've dealt with, and also how many years have they established themselves in the market. If they're relatively new, um, then, you know, it's very hard to tell. But if they have a really massive client portfolio and they've been in the market for a while, it's very likely that their team has a pretty high technical skills set. Um, now, the next thing to consider is quality. Um, so in-house developers, I'd say you definitely have a lot more quality control. Um, you know, as the founder, you'll be working very closely with your in-house developers to really shape your product and make sure that it's launched in a way that you're really happy with. Um, now, when it comes to an agency, I think quality depends. Um, and, you know, in terms of the control that you have, it has limitations. Um, in terms of how you work with, I guess, uh, development agencies, usually the project manager will be your point of contact. Um, you need to sort of convey your messages and tell them what you need, and they will have to manage a team of developers to make that vision happen. So um, there's definitely a bit of limitation in terms of quality because chances are, you know, there might be a bit of miscommunication in between and um, it's definitely manageable, but, you know, that's something that you should keep in mind as well. Um, and in terms of scalability, um, in terms of like, you know, not the product itself, but scaling the team, um, I'd say in-house developer has a, a mid um, or a moderate type of scalability. If your product grows and you need to add a lot more development time and resources onto it, the only way to scale is to hire another developer. Um, and whereas an agency, if you need to do a lot of iterations or launch new features, um, an agency can always assign new developers to work on that as a project. So uh, for agencies, it's, it's really high, like uh, in terms of like scalability. Now, um, I've just, you know, told you a whole bunch of things to consider, but I, I think it's probably good to sort of shine a light in terms of like, why do people outsource uh, their product to development agencies. So delegating that task of building and expanding your product to an agency definitely has its pros. Um, you can, number one, optimize your development cost. It's, you know, relatively cheaper to get started and you can access a worldwide community of talented developers. Um, you can also get a lot of expert advice from seasoned professionals who have helped other startups like yours to succeed. Um, I think we can sort of all agree that the, the talent pool in Australia it can be quite limited at times, whereas, you know, um, uh, there's certain countries that have a lot of developer resources. That's one way to sort of think about, you know, why outsourcing um, is, is a good idea because, you know, it gives you a wider pool of talents to tap into. And um, I guess outsourcing is, is also a means of finding developers without having to go through an exhaustive list of uh, hiring process. Um, it's great for building your first version of your product, so an MVP. And it's all, it's also probably the easiest way for you to get to from point A to B. Um, and and in, in the early stage startup context, point A to B is like, how do you get a product started ASAP so that you can test product market fit and understand, is this something you want to pursue or do you need to, you know, tweak and pivot? Um, so, you know, one of the questions that a lot of startup founders often ask um, is that, you know, investors often want to invest in startups that are build, building their products in-house. Um, but I think from my experience, it's not really a prerequisite as long as you can justify it. Um, I, in my experience, I, you know, build the products uh, with development agencies, still managed to raise a bit of money. So raised over 1.1 million from VCs and angels. And I think the right investors will understand why you decide to outsource uh, your tech to an agency or to uh, third party agencies, third party developers, as long as you can justify that this is like a cost cutting method that you want to, you know, test um, your your product market fit or uh, you know whatever reasons you have, I'm I'm sure your investors will understand. 
Now, there are a lot of successful startups that also have built with outsourced developers. And some examples are like GitHub, AppZumo, Groove, Slack, Upwork. Um, but the common theme I see in these sort of success stories is that they these companies have used outsourced development teams to build the MVP and the initial products and have gradually moved things in-house once they see some sort of serious traction. Um, so I guess the key here is for you uh, to decide what you want to build, have a bit of a vision of why you're doing this and what you want to achieve. You know, one, once you have a vision of what you are looking to achieve with your product, then you can decide if you want to outsource it or get a developer in-house and just like trying to build something, um, but really understand your budget and when do you need this by and really just have have an outline of product specifications. Like what is your ideal scenario that you want to pursue at this stage? And then pretty much go from there. Um, there's, you know, I, I noticed that on the poll, there's a few people trying to build, you know, their, their version 1.0 uh, through like a no code sort of uh, web-based potentially. And then there's also people that are like building it organically, which is like a code or, or doing a bit of hybrid. Um, I think for you to decide whether or not this is a good idea, again, it's for you to really understand um, how, I guess, the longevity of this MVP that you want this to last, right? Do you want to build this product where you can continue to iterate and use it for the next five, 10 years? Or do you just want to build something pretty scrappy and um, ready to abandon it after like a couple of months once you've test out, like run some pilot tests? Um, I guess for the no code ones, um, one thing to really just, you know, be mindful of is it's definitely cheaper to build a no code based product, um, but it's probably best for an MVP or stage one type of product where you just want something, um, want to build something where you can get user feedback, do pilot tests. Um, and, you know, another thing to sort of consider is that no code products usually lack scale. So if, you know, understanding that startups likely to do things that don't scale um so that's one thing to, to sort of consider and then if you're building uh, one with coding which can be quite costly at times um you know are you doing this to test a wider market are you ready to um, monetize um this obviously has a bit of a higher longevity and it's more scalable so that's some of the things to consider um and i guess the other thing to consider is like not all the outsourcing model is the same. And so, you know, when you choose the developers, um, really pay close attention to how these agencies or developers engage with your mission and objective. Because if they're not passionate, um, just like any other candidates you're hiring, if they if they don't feel that pain point, they're not excited with your about your mission or objective, chances are that relationship's not going to last. So that's another thing to consider. I realize we're running quite time, uh, tight with time. So I'm going to quickly go through this um, now. So um, first stage uh, of finding a developer uh, development agency is looking at the search process. Um, I would really encourage, you know, early stage founders to really just treat this as a learning opportunity, uh, really explore and understand all the options that you have and try and gather a decent sample size of what is the norm and what is like, you know, what is the best way to build your product? Uh, what is the sort of budget, uh, budget range that you are looking at? And, you know, be able to make an informed decision of which other agencies you want to move into due diligence. So um, now before the search, again, you know, really important for you to understand what is your mission? What is your objective? Um, do you have an idea of what your product could look like? you know, just outlining those specifications. And if you're really new to this and you have no idea what you're doing, just like me back in 2017, it's okay. Just come up with a list of questions and just start the conversation somewhere with a developer because over time you're going to start to piece things together and be able to find um, and have a, a pretty good understanding and idea of what you want to build. Now, in terms of the channels um, that, you know, where where do you find these development agencies? Um, for me, I really just used Google and LinkedIn and be really specific with my search query. 
Um, I knew that I was building a mobile app to begin with, and I knew that I wanted to be, um, you know, available on Android and iOS. So I was just looking at different keywords um, to find a list of contacts that I can speak with. Now, the platform that I used, which I ended up finding my, my agency, was actually a hiring marketplace. So I used One Flare. This was like five years ago. I'm not really sure if One Flare is still relevant, but there are a lot of hiring marketplaces that have um, agencies that are, you know, looking at jobs that they want to take. So One Flare is a good place. Um, I think Freelancer um, is, is also a good idea. Um, and then the other thing is word of mouth is always great. Um, you know, given how uh, you know prosperous the startup community is today, I think word of mouth is a great way of finding information and talking to developers as well. And I think the other thing to note is that you know some agencies that do really well aren't always great at self promotion. Um, not to say that they might not have a good portfolio. Uh, to showcase. I think that's actually a red flag if they don't have a, a strong portfolio that they can showcase the work. Any agencies that aren't proud to show their work is probably a red flag. But what I mean by self-promotion is, you know, not all agencies know how to operate in a marketing sense where they can, you know, really hone into SEOs and, and push their ads up to Google. So don't give up after page two on Google. I, I you know, would suggest you to dig really deep um, to really find these agencies. Um, and now moving on to who, speaking with the right people is also super important. Um, now, depending on how big these agencies are, I would, I would suggest talking to project managers because these are the people that you will be working on with every day and communicating your vision to and making sure everything's in line with what you're expecting. Um, now, large scale agencies, the directors, um, you know, anyone that's like director or really senior level at, at a large agency, they're usually very focused on the sales side. So they just really focus on getting, you know, clients and building pipelines. So they're not really, they might not be the direct project managers or be able to answer all the technical questions that you have. Uh, whereas like mid to small agencies, project managers are usually the directors of the firm as well. But just really make sure you speak to the right people at this point. Um, and when you do get to speak to a project manager, I think the most important thing for your initial screening is to test their soft skills. So are they empathetic? You know, do they have a great communication skill? What's their background? And do, do they have any technical skills? Um, if I think one red flag here is if they're really bad with communicating and completely lost plot, that's probably not the agency you want to work with. Um, because if they can't distill any sort of vision or complex ideas into something simple and take it to their team, chances are they're going to build something that you do not want. Um, now, in terms of how do you speak to them, I think very easy setting up meetings. Um, if they have a phone number, I would just directly call and cut to the chase and ask them, hey, is this a good time to call? Um, now, if, if that doesn't work, emailing to schedule a time is always a great idea as well. And I guess for your initial assessment, once you get on this call and have a contact list, uh, this is where you want to share your mission and objective. And if you're if you come from a technical background, highly recommend you to unlearn everything you know and just seek feedback um, and ask a lot of questions. This is again your learning opportunity. Just try and fill in a lot of knowledge gaps that you have. And um, I would also try and find out what's the technical skills of the agency's um, development team. So, you know, um, just try and, try and find like relevant relevancy in, in terms of their technical skills and also versus what you're trying to build. Now, if you're building a SaaS software and you're talking to an agency that specializes in building mobile apps, that's probably not going to work for you in the long haul. So if you're building a SaaS type of product uh, that you need to be compatible with all the other gadgets. You want to be finding an agency that has experience building that and have a portfolio to show you. Um, and in terms of the structure of the agencies, really understand, do they have like UX UI team as well to help them sort out what's the best customer flow? Um, you know, do they also outsource this part or do they do everything in-house? I'd say if they outsource a lot of their capabilities, um, you know, to another third party, that's probably something I would stay away because then it gets 
to a, a bit of a complex level, you know, a lot of um, layers of communication is probably not great uh, for, for like a relationship longevity point of view. Um, and in terms of budget, so if you don't know how much your product is going to cost, this is the great time for you to speak to a lot of developers and just ask them like, okay, so based on what you've said, how much do you think this is going to cost? How much time do you think this is going to take? And if you speak to a lot of people, you're probably going to start to get a different range of budget cost. Um, and for me, I had no idea how much it's going to cost me to build something. So um, after speaking with like you know, over 50 developers, I had a pretty decent sample size of what is actually a reasonable budget. Um, I ended up opting in for the lower end, but not the cheapest. Um, I think price sometimes indicates quality, but I think most importantly is to be able to justify, like, you know, understand how they're quoting. And if they're, if the team is based in overseas, like say a place in India, which uh, was the case in my case, labor costs is relatively cheap. And, you know, if the team is based in India, but they're quoting you Australian dollar price, that's probably another red flag to look out for. Um, so yeah, budget is a hundred percent negotiable, but this is the chance for you to find out, you know, roughly how much you're looking for. Um, and I would say with initial screening, it's always good to ask the question about IP ownership to begin with, like, what is the norm when they take on a client and build their product? Do they, um, you know, do they take over the IP ownership? And if so, do they give you an option to buy that? Or do they give you an option to sort of like get that, uh, you know, transfer that own ownership from day one? That's probably one of the hard lessons I learned is I did not talk about IP and then realized afterwards that my developers actually own the IP to the code, whereas I own the IP to the product, which are very different. Um, you know, the product is like the branding, the look and feel of everything, um, whereas the code is what you need to transfer if you need to build, bring things in-house. So I think this is something that definitely talk, you should talk about um, at your initial screening process. Um, again, this is a, a pretty much an artifact that you can show your investors that you can have the phone ownership, full ownership, or have control over your product, or at least have the option to exercise if you need to actually get the IP on your hand. Now, moving on. So some of the right questions to ask developers and agencies, uh, which I've covered some previously. Now, this is the due diligence phase. So um, I guess after the search process, you assuming you speak to like 10 or 20 um, agencies and you've sort of narrowed it down to maybe like half or 30% of that, um, this is where you sort of do your DD and really understand which is the agency you want to work with. Um, so I'd say just like hiring any other talents, really treat this like an interview. Um, so again, first thing I mentioned was like really testing the soft skills, um, talking to the right people. Do they have uh, empathy towards your mission? Are they excited about your, your objective? Um, are they good at communicating with you to begin with? And uh, this is another thing I would uh, try and ask is, you know, what does their process look like? Like once contract is signed, what happens next? And who's going to be managing the timeline? How do they prioritize projects when there's like conflicting projects happening at the same time? Um, another thing I would look at just to sort of like find out if there is a red flag is understanding the turnover um, of their, their internal developers. If the turnover rate is really high, that's probably not an agency you want to look at um, because imagine like the developers that are working on your project and halfway through they drop out, some new developers come in. It's going to drag out time and cost and it's just a bit of a headache. So I would look at turnover rate from the agency's point of view in, in their internal team. How they also hire their own developers is another good question to ask. Um, you really want the project managers that work with the developers directly to be making their own hiring decisions. Um, you know, this is all a part of just a found early stage founder mitigating risks from day one, because outsourcing something so intimate like a product to an agency is quite risky. And this is the part where you need to ask a lot of questions to de-risk. Um, and this is another thing that I, I think really important, which I've spoken about is 
look at their previous work, get them to show your portfolio and ask them to, to give you like maybe three or five um, contacts like to, for you to do reference checks. This is so important. I cannot stress enough. I've had heard a lot of nightmare stories where founders do not do that and then end up in a legal dispute with the developers that just try to screw them over after signing contracts. Um, so this is definitely important to remember. Um, and then the other thing is to understand contract terms um, before you start negotiating the contracts. So, you know, what does the scope look like when it comes to budgeting? Um, and, you know, after they build a product, can you like, do they give founders uh, a little bit of like a leeway in terms of time where you can change features for free or make iterations for free or at a, at a fraction of a cost. I think those are also very important just to make sure that you have a very successful start once your product is out in the market. Um, and then also understanding what the future iteration is going to cost um, and how they actually give you those budget. Um, you know, are they able to sort of break down the budget for you? The other thing is payment terms. Um, if a developer tells you you need to pay everything lump sum all like upfront, that's a red flag because <laughs> no one will pay anything like five digit dollar amount at the get-go. Um, I think what's the norm that I've seen is that people break down these um, costs, uh, payment terms in development stages. So it's like 30%, 50%, then uh, potentially another 20% at the end, but it's based on stages and you need to be able to see things are actually being built before you can pay more. Um, so payment terms is very important. Um, and also the last thing is like, just try and understand if they've had any cases where clients are not, are not happy um, in the middle of a project or after a project and they decided to walk out and how did they resolve this? So this is a, a good question to ask. Um, it's, it's almost like, you know, understanding the agency's uh, contingency plan and how do they deal with unhappy customers? That's also super important. And <clears throat> moving on to contract negotiations. Um, so I think just really important for the founders to really set expectations um, and, you know, agree these terms prior to signing any contracts with the agency. Um, and, you know, you just remember that as the client, you have full control on these terms. They don't have to be on the agency's terms. So you can set your deliverables, set your timeline payment terms and your IP terms and, um, you know, just have an open conversation with the agencies and negotiate on that end. Um, and I would also look at potentially additional maintenance costs post-launch. This is something that I did not factor in at the start, but it was actually okay because the agency um, did actively, you know, communicate and say, you know, occasionally when you build a tech, it's always going to have bugs. There's always going to be downtime and you always need to have developers at the back end just, just to like work through these challenges. Um, so maintenance cost is a pretty much like a subscription fee. So really understand that what that cost means to you. And also like what's the, some of the post-launch responsibilities and, and who's the direct responsible uh, individual uh, to look at, at, you know, if things don't go well, if, you know, there's downtime with the products, can the agencies, um, you know, support you along the way? And I guess with the clauses and waivers for future protection. Um, so I think it's always good to plan for the absolute worst. Um, not to say that I'm a pessimist, but I think it's always good to plan for the worst so that you can come up with clauses now to protect yourself down the down the track. Um, so in in the case like you know potentially labor cost rises like is there going to be any price increase per per hour if this is what they're quoting you on um, and in case of insolvency and and the agency goes bankrupt what's going to happen next um you know if if you've already paid like half the fees but they go bankrupt and nothing's being built um how do you go about mitigating that risk those are some of the questions that you should ask and put in clauses in the contract to protect yourself um, now ndas are, are optional i know that um, some founders are really, really cautious about sharing ideas at the start. Um, this is definitely optional. Um, if, you know, I'm sure if you've got like a legal representative, they can easily draft up something to, to help you. And if this gives you peace of mind, you can definitely include that. 
Um, and I think most importantly is the IP part and the exclusivity clause. So IP is, you know, intellectual property, anything that you want to have full ownership, make sure you um, talk about it and put clauses in from day one. Exclusivity clause is something that is also very important and again protects the founders at the start because some agencies what they will do is they will build a similar tech and if some similar client that also want to build a similar product they might just use that source code same thing replicate it um, you do not want that because you've paid in full um, you know in, in in terms of like building your product you want to just protect it and make sure that you're the only client that can use this down the track so exclusivity clause is something that I would recommend and last but not least, um, if you have anything in doubt, make sure you get a legal representative to read through the contract and point out any flaws or any clauses that you should continue to include. Um, now, just quickly going over some red flags, if the developers have really vague terms yet refuse to specify the scope or timing, um, or if they're very unresponsive and lack of communication, or actually, and you know, if they're rushing you and, and tell you like, oh, this this deal is only available until this week, like those things are definitely red flags. Um, you know, everyone needs time to go through these contract terms. So don't don't like if if anyone makes you feel like you're being pressured to sign something, that's probably a red flag. Um, the other thing is if the estimation is too good to be true, um, and this is why you need to compare rates across different agencies. If the estimate is too good to be true, that's another red flag, I would say. Um, you know, over promise, under deliver, that's something that you don't really want to be in a situation in. And um, if in the case that the agency is giving you a quote and they're unable to break down and itemize the estimation or give you some sort of money back guarantee promises, that's another red flag, I think. Um, you know, if they're really that confident with their skills and how they build products, they shouldn't have a money back guarantee promise, which apparently it's quite common with a lot of agencies. Um, now, very closely wrapping up. So, you know, what's next? Um, lastly, so with after you sign the contract and pretty much uh, working through this product, there's really just two ways of how this relationship with an agency can go. So one is you are pretty much growing this client agency relationship and you're working with them really well um, and you just build, build on this relationship. You have new features and bugs that they're happy to fix. Um, and that if, if you do go into that direction, I think one tip is that you review the contracts on a regular basis. So maybe like quarterly or semi-annually semi probably is, is the uh, more realistic review term. And just, um, you know, if there's anything that changed, make sure you update these contracts so that you have a smooth selling relationship going forward. Now, the second, um, the, the second, I guess, way to end this is to pretty much end the client agency relationship for whatever reasons. Um, if you want to move things in-house and you decide to not use an agency anymore, or if the agency is just like giving you so much headache, um, this is where, you know, that contract and putting in clauses is very important and comes into play. So make sure you have clauses where you can actually break any contracts at any time. Like you don't, you're not in a fixed or lock-in contract. That's also super important. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm, I've gone out a bit uh, over time, but open to Q&As. <laughs> That was fantastic, Jane. Thank you for going through all of that in detail. Uh, we do have a few questions from uh, people on the call too, so we'll just jump straight into them. Anita yeah. has asked, how do you manage and ensure the exclusivity clause is being adhered to? <clears throat> uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? How do I? Manage and ensure yeah. that the exclusivity clause is yeah. being adhered to. Yeah, so um, I guess one way to to make sure um, is you constantly look at their client base and see if anyone's building something similar. Um, but I think over time, this, this does all distill into, you know, having trust with this agency. Um, and if you spot anything weird with like their client base and, you know, if, if there's a, a very similar product that they're building that looks exactly similar to yours, you can always ask them, 
to share some of the, the code in terms of comparison and maybe just get like an external party to do a bit of comparison to see how different these codes are. Um, now, it, there's no really concrete way of comparing it, though, because the agency can always refuse to share these codes with you due to privacy reasons. Um, so I guess it, it does all come down to trust. Yeah. Thanks, heaps, Jane. We've got another interesting one from Catherine. What sort of figure do you think is too good to be true for for an organic app development? But I also yeah. want to say you did say that you you got a huge range from each developer you spoke to, right? And I think yeah. you said a range from like thirty grand to one hundred and fifty grand. Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of hard to say as well if you don't know what the app is and how long it's going to take. Uh, but what what do you think is like a red flag too good to be true? Uh, good question. It, a red flag is like a too good to be true would be like if you're building a website for instance and you're using an agency and they're telling you five hundred dollars and we can get it up and running today that's probably a red flag a really strong one because anything good will take time to build um but if you're building some sort of like mobile app which you know in, in my scenario i was building two two apps and a back end um, I had a quote, which was about 50 grand. And, you know, I think for you to really understand what's a too good to be true scenario is to really get the agency to itemize how they're quoting you. Um, and some agencies will quote you based on developer hours required and, you know, cost per hour. Some will quote you based on like um, how much is going to, you know, cost to build specific features, but in a very detailed form. Um, any sort of itemization that is very, very vague is probably a too good to be true scenario, I would say. Yeah. Amazing tips. I love that as well. <clears throat> Anything good will take time to build. And I think I might share that afterwards, Jane, because it's. Uh, yeah. I feel like that's a summary, right? Every, anything good will take time. Uh, Anita has asked a curly question as well. She spoke to developers that have told us that they wouldn't take on our customer build at a later date if they went down the no-code, low-code route to begin with. Is that a red flag as an agency or just not a good fit? Your thoughts, Jane? Um, so can I just clarify from Anita that, um, so wouldn't take on our customer build at a later date, as in what was oh, the- custom build, custom build. Sorry, she just clarified. So the custom build at a later date. So it sounds like they're gonna make a no code. They were planning on making a no yeah. code, low code uh, MVP. And then yeah. an agency said they wouldn't take on their custom build later because they have their no code, low code. Option. Yeah, okay. I guess just to clarify, it seems like in the developer world, like you really have to pick like, are you going low code, no code? Are you going custom build? But there's no one really you could grow with. And so no matter what you pick, it feels like you're always like, well, for this stage, I'm with you. And then mm -hmm. you really have to like tweak and adapt your new set of developers that you could work with once you did a low code, no code, because half of them are like, well, now you've done that. I don't want to do it. Like, is is that yeah. just the nature of it? Like mm -hmm. every stage, you just have to go back to the drawing board and figure out who's your right fit next. I I, I think that there are agencies, there are um, different types of agencies, ones that will only focus on building no code, low code type of product. And that's what they specialize in. Um, and then there's the agencies that don't know how to do no code, low code, and only know how to do coding type of products. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's a red flag, but I would again, go back to understanding why you're building a no code, low code to begin with, um, because this agency is likely just not, they don't have the specialization to do a custom build down the track and they they just wanted to flag it out with you in advance so that you don't end up in a pickle um so i think just asking them a lot more questions about you know why is this the case um are they not confident with their custom build uh, technical skills or, or do they just not have any developers that can do coding um those are some of the questions to ask but I, I do agree with you. I think once you go down to one route and you want to switch to another, you're likely going to have to find an agency that specializes in the other field to take over the project. Yeah. That's so interesting as well, because I would have thought these agencies would be really happy that you're validated, you've tested, you've got something to show them already that uh, you want to take to the next level. So that's very interesting that some developers are saying that to uh, founders. Uh, we just had a comment that someone else has had that experience as well. 
Uh, we've got a very interesting one from Annie, which we hear about a lot <clears throat> as well. We have a contact who is offering to help with development for free until we are revenue generating. It's all very early discussions, but we're wondering if you had any advice here. And we hear this a lot as well. People have a friend of a friend who's a developer who can work on it in their spare time, you know, and even they, though they might not have the perfect skills, um, it's free. So you want to take advantage of it, right? But mm. any tips on that, Jane? Because I think there are a lot of red flags in those situations, right? And it doesn't always work out very well and it's hard to get uh, kind of those agreements in place. But any any yeah. thoughts on that, Jane? Um, I, I think it's a, like I would have loved for when I was doing this for my time, someone was offering to do free, you know, development work. Um, I think it's definitely a risky thing, but it's it's also not a bad idea, um, especially if you are just looking to build something super scrappy and, and test the market straight away. Um, if, if they're asking for equity from day one, that's when I would see that as a red flag. Um, and, you know, if they're like, well, if there's no equity, well, can I get some sort of compensation to begin with? Um, that's, again, a conversation, you know, for you and that friend uh, to to really tease out what the agreement is. Um, I think, I think you know, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt that some of them are genuinely really passionate about what you're trying to build and want to be a part of that journey and just like help you get going. Um, so I, I wouldn't completely rule that out. But what I would do, though, is to give uh, that person a bit of a time frame and say, OK, sure, this is what I'm building. I need something up and running in six months. And if that time runs out, you need to shop for another option. That's probably like a really good way to sort of, you know, give yourself and that person a time limit and just to test out if they have the skills to put, build something very quickly for you. Yeah. Excellent tips, Jane. I think a lot of this uh, kind of uh, contracts and discussions are all about expectation setting, right? What are you expecting as a founder? And then what do they expect from you? And what kind of work are they expecting to do as well long term? Okay, we've got a couple more questions. I'm just going to go back to one from Athy, who said for overseas agencies, how can we be sure that their staff are being paid a living wage and not being exploited? Any tips for that, Jane? That's a good question. You can ask them to send you any sort of paid slips, um, you know, and any sort of documentations uh, or like employee contracts that really shows that this is the right, that they are paying the developers fairly. Uh, now, agencies that don't want to share that, I think potentially a red flag if, if this is what you really care about. Um, and if they're worried about privacy uh, for whatever reasons, you can always ask them to block out the, the names and the address um, in that payslip. But I think seeing something in documents uh, is, is going to be a pretty good indication to answer that question and, and see if you know, they pay their developers fairly. Amazing, Jane. I love this advice as well. Often you're just like, ask them and make them prove it. And I think that's a really easy way to do it, right? They don't have to show you who exactly the employee is. You know, they can yeah. um, remove all of that personal data. So that's an excellent tip. Yeah. Uh, the, Michelle, I was just, oh, sorry. You sorry. Go. Another tip that I have is you can always ask to also speak to a developer and ask them directly. Yeah. Very, very, very good tip. Uh, Michelle, uh, I was just wondering if you could clarify uh, your question, because you've said when it comes to starting a startup in Australia, more risk adverse, what kind of things will VC think highly of? Uh, mm. do, do you just mean in general for startups or do you mean using a development team? Um, and then she's also asked, what would be a good combo of the team numbers and roles for a startup to want to work on an app? Uh, again, I think it all depends on what the app is, what you're going to build as well. But um, maybe Jane, if you could just talk us through what the team looked like for you. Yeah. So, um, well, when I engaged with an agency, it was just really myself um, and the agency didn't really, you know, they, they were really passionate about the idea. And so they didn't really um, care about the fact that I was just myself um, and I guess for the agency that the way their team is structured is that the project manager came from a background where, you know, he has a bit of a technical background and also he came from a UX UI background. So he was doing a lot of the design work in building the product as well. Um, and the team was pretty big. I think they had about 30 developers all based in India. Um, all of them are structured in a way that, you know, about three to four developers would work on a project at a time. And depending on if there's like new clients that come through, they would 
they would then go out and hire new developers. Um, one thing that I really liked about the agency that I worked with is that he hires his own developers because he works directly with them. Um, so whenever there's like, if they're growing their client base and or like a lot of clients need to launch new features and they're short staffed, they would always just look at hiring more people and scaling their team that way. Yeah. Amazing. And uh, we've just got a final question, which I might take offline, Jane, because we'd love to um, hear your insights on this. Catherine's asked, are you comfortable recommending any of these agencies? And considering that you spoke to 50 and then narrowed it down to one, I think we'll yeah. take that offline and hopefully um, you can recommend some of them. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to take over sharing screen and wrap up as well. But do you have any final thoughts, Jane, that you'd like to share? Uh, no, not at all. I guess, um, you know, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. So if anyone has any other questions that, you know, I haven't had the chance to address, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn, more than happy to, um, you know, answer some Q and A's through there, but yeah, like all the best with building your first product. It's super exciting and daunting at the same time. I know, um, but don't worry, like, you know, this is what the community is here for here to share some learnings and, and yeah, like help you guys along the way. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jane. We definitely learned a lot from the session and oh my goodness, I'm, I've got a whole bunch of notes as well to go back and look at. So again, thank you so much uh, for sharing all of your time and expertise with us. I'm just going to do a little wrap up now uh, before we finish off. Uh, so with all Atto public events, uh, we give access to the Atto founders as well through our um, Circle platform. Uh, if you're interested in joining Atto, we have an accelerated program, a pre-accelerated program, but if you would like more support outside of these official program times, you can join the Academy membership where, and we've got different tiers. So if you're interested in that, feel free to submit a expression of interest at atto.vc forward slash EOI. If you're interested in investing in female founders, please contact Kate Kendall. And if you want to learn about the uh, 100 plus female founders that we've supported already at Atto, go to atto.bc forward slash startups. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions at all. We are very approachable and we love supporting female founders to build businesses on their own terms. And we've got another awesome upcoming event that you might be interested in. Next month, we've got Office Hours with Sarah from End Time, and she's made a really amazing impact on families across Australia. Uh, she scaled her business, raised capital, and we get into all of the juicy details about the realities of building a startup. So once again, Jane, thank you so much for all of your expertise and your advice and sharing here as well. We will share some resources uh, in the follow-up from the email and since it's 2 p.m i'll close off the call now and thank you all for joining us and as always if you have any questions feel free to reach out to atto thanks so much <laughs>